Dan Gordon will unleash the superhero in you. In each episode, Dan will challenge and inspire you to be the greatest version of yourself. Dan takes you into the minds of the world's most innovative thinkers, unlocking their secrets for living fearlessly and achieving massive personal success. So get ready for Shock to the System. Please welcome your host, the coach's coach, Dan Gordon. Before we begin, know this. Right now, in this moment, you have the power to live your life unlimited. Shock to the System is about pulling back the curtain on your world and seeing what you're truly capable of achieving. In the next hour, I promise to open up your mind, to set your thinking on fire, to show you your superhero self that you've been hiding from yourself. Come with me and let's enter a new reality where your success can happen in an instant. Strap in. We're putting a shock to your system. Let's go. Throughout your life, you have been told over and over again that practice makes perfect. As an entrepreneur, perfection is what we're always seeking. The perfect product, the perfect website, the perfect marketing plan. We want perfection in every way that we do business. Because perfection is what will make us successful, right? Wrong, wrong, wrong. Perfection is killing your business. Perfection slows you down. It creates a bar that you can never reach. It trips you up and creates endless stress in every area of your life. Striving for perfection will do nothing but ruin you. Google, arguably one of the most successful companies in the world, launched their website on a plain white background with just their name and a search field. Everyone said, you can't do that. You have to put content on your homepage. Elon Musk started an electric car and a rocket chip company without any idea how to be successful. Apple has a long history of putting out products and software that to begin with never work perfectly. You know you're not smarter than any of these companies. And that means there is something to be learned here. Like Google, like Elon, like Apple, you must adopt the philosophy that done is better than perfect. The reason that you and most entrepreneurs work so hard at perfection is simply because you're afraid. You're afraid of being criticized. You're afraid to fail. Most of all, you're afraid of how you'll beat yourself up if you believe that you have failed. And that's key. The degree to which we can forgive ourselves when we fail is the degree to which we can learn, grow, and come back stronger. Did you know that the first fleet of Teslas were so flawed that Elon had to scrap them all and start over from scratch? At the same time, he couldn't get a rocket to take off without it exploding. He was in debt hundreds of millions of dollars, and yet he kept going. Right now in the world, there are thousands of unfinished novels, millions of half-written business plans, and billions of brilliant ideas that never make it off the drawing board. And why? Because entrepreneurs are addicted to perfection. I suffered from that addiction. Five years ago, when I thought up Shock to the System, I was tormented by the fear that my podcast would suck. And now, half a decade later, know what? I don't care. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I bust my ass to make sure that every one of these shows are extraordinary. The truth is, is that failure and imperfection will drive you forward faster and harder than anything else in the world. Forget about setting goals. If you want to experience radical growth and transformation in your business and your life, put imperfection out there in the marketplace and watch what happens. When I started creating these shows, I offered a free copy of my book in every episode, and I'll do that for you in just a moment. The thing was, back then, I hadn't even written a book. 
I knew that between the time I recorded my first show and when we launched this podcast, I damn well better write that book and get it out into the world. Now, I'm not suggesting you put a bunch of crap out there in the marketplace. I'm suggesting you adopt my philosophy of done is better than perfect. Keep progressing towards excellence. Just don't wait for perfection. People won't buy your product because it's perfect. People buy your product when you fire up their excitement and enthusiasm for it. That's why learning how to sell is so much more important than even what you're selling. And that's a topic for another conversation. For now, remember the book I mentioned? It's called Jumping the Gap, Kill Your Story and Take Action. To get my book for free, just text the word GAP, G-A-P, to my cell phone, 213-409-8366. 213-409-8366 and text the word GAP, G-A-P. I'll send you my book, Jumping the Gap, Kill Your Story and Take Action, for free. Well, I am so honored to introduce my guest, Ernie Singleton. He is one of the most important people who built the foundation of black music in America. Every entrepreneur is faced with barriers, but Mr. Singleton managed to push through racism, greed, hate to fulfill on his vision of giving black artists the success they were due. If you want to learn how to stay committed to a vision, Mr. Singleton is going to have the answers. From very modest beginnings, he was born to a construction worker and housekeeper in New Orleans and raised alongside, ready, 10 brothers and two sisters. Wow. Ernie studied accounting at Southern University while working as a DJ on New Orleans WBOK. Upon graduating, he couldn't get a job in accounting and decided to return to his first love of music. Ernie then moved from being a DJ to a record promoter for Fantasy Records, where he had record-breaking success in promoting their artist. Mercury Records got wind of Ernie, hired him on the spot, and gave him an extensive roster of gold and platinum R&B artists to promote. His reputation for success then landed him a job with Casablanca Records in 1977. That was at the height of the disco era, and Ernie represented artists like Donna Summer, Cher, and the Village People. I love it. Ernie was then lured away to Warner Brothers in 1987, where he worked with artists such as Prince and Madonna. There, he single-handedly reactivated their Reprise Records label and made it so successful, Warner went from number seven in the industry to number one. In 1990, MCA Universal offered Ernie the coveted position of head of their urban music division. There, he helped bring hip-hop to the mainstream consumer audience. Over the course of his career, Ernie Singleton helped cultivate heavy-hitting acts such as Patti LaBelle, Prince, Gladys Knight, Quincy Jones, and many, many others. With over 150 gold and platinum records to his credit, it's no surprise that he is widely referred to as the man with the platinum touch. Today, he is president and CEO of Singleton Entertainment, an entertainment consulting company. And he's launched a podcast called My Business is Pleasure. I'm just so excited to have him on the show. Mr. Singleton, welcome, welcome, welcome to Shock to the System. You're shocking me. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's weird. I'm used to setting up stuff like this for artists and other people, Ah. not not myself. So I I do... (laughs) I, What's uh, it? I, well, I guess I'm getting a taste of my own medicine. <laughs> <laughs> well, here you are in the hot seat, and I'm so glad that you're here uh, because you have so much to share for my audience. Um, it, and, and I just want to dive in. Is that okay? Absolutely. Great. So uh, uh, I, I want to tell you one of the things that grabbed my attention immediately about you. You said success was about creating theater of the mind, and I found this so interesting. I, I, I guess what I'm really asking is, how did theater of the mind serve you throughout your career? Because it- well, theater of the mind was always. Um, let me go back to radio. Thanks. In radio, I had to envision what was going on in the household, in the automobile, 
in the in the space of whoever was in the audience. And it was multiple people and some things were good, some were bad. So the theater of the mind for me was I had to to uh, command. Uh, I used to use the term command the suspension of your attention. You were able to draw pictures in people's minds to, as you just said, like capture their attention. And, you know, even when you didn't have a long list of accomplishments, you could still capture people's attention. And and that is so powerful. Like, I mean, how do you think you did that? I was just always tuned in. Hmm. I, I'd hire people, but I, and it didn't matter what you did before. If I was interviewing you to hire you. Yeah. What you're going to do in the job that I'm hiring you for is consistent. Doesn't matter who you are. So I would interview people with an, uh, mainly looking for their natural thinking ability, their spontaneity, how well they think on their feet. Ah. Um, and how well they read between the lines. I, I have I have literally fired people because I knew they did not read between the lines. God, and that's so important because, you know, a lot of people think, well, I have, you know, I'm going to build up my my resume of all of my accomplishments. But what you're saying is, hey, we're going to put, you know, uh, the accomplishments maybe get you in the door. But what closes the deal are these abilities that you're talking about, these communication abilities. Do, do I have that right? You have it absolutely right. I think education, colleges sell us on the idea of, hey, when you get this uh, this degree, that's going to thing that's going to close the deal on on getting a job. But what I found over and over, and what and what you're saying is, man, it's personality. You know, it's it's your ability to think on your feet. I, I'll give you a quick quick story. Thanks. Uh, first, I never interviewed people without two people in, being in the interview. Okay. I interviewed one guy who who beat me up to interview him. I knew him. He was a friend. He was a, a, a college student and a college radio guy. We're friends. I'm going to interview him, but I like, I know, you know he's not going to get the job. I interviewed this guy, and when the interview was over, me and my, my, my junior executive, a guy named Ray Harris, we talked about this guy, and out of all the people we had interviewed that day who had all this skill, had label experience, the whole nine yards, this guy smoked them all wow we thought wow Wow. so so when people kind of give you the sense that they 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 have the drive um that they're they're quick on their feet in terms of thinking they're solution oriented those are the kind of people that i always look for gotcha you know i want to talk about these 10 brothers and two sisters you know because i i I have a feeling that you were always the go-getter of the family that you were always the one and like everybody knew that ernie was going to be the 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 successful one the, is that right? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> really? You know, and that um, yeah. It, 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 I I'm number nine. I'm number oh nine out of God. the thirteen, right? Right. But what what did happen, uh, Dan, was my brothers and sisters' friends were my friends, mm-hmm. even though I didn't know them. I didn't know their names. I just knew their faces. But I was always tuned into the room. I have a sense that kind of what you're saying is it's never too early to start building your network. Never I want to jump uh, to college. You know, you you studied accounting while you worked as a, uh, as a DJ. Uh, and then when you graduated, everybody in your interviews didn't want to talk about accounting. They wanted to talk about music. And, yeah. you know, you, you said that you couldn't get a job in accounting. When did you realize that you were trying to get a job in the wrong business. Interesting. I didn't realize it until I went on job interviews. When people would interview me, they wanted to know, did I know um, Aretha Franklin? Or wow, Kim yeah. Kane? Did I know James Brown? Had I ever met him? And the answer was yes, <laughs> to all of them. So, so the conversation in the interview would change. Yeah. So the interviewer talking to me about the music and the music people and how much fun that must have been or whatever. And I was like, like, what the hell? There had to be a moment, right? There had to be a moment where you said, oh man, I I think I need to abandon accounting and go back into music, right? And that was probably really hard, you know? And, and, and a lot of people come to that moment where like, well, oh, I put all my time and energy into one thing, but this other thing is calling me. And do I take the risk of abandoning this one thing and go with the, like how did you build up that courage to make that choice? Well, it was easy. First, my thought was, these people don't believe I really wanna work in accounting. I said, I know what I'll do. I'll quit my radio job and have a full-time job, job hunting. Full-time job, job hunting, 
doesn't pay you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I started spinning records at different clubs. Yeah. So I made money. Uh, in the process, one of my mentors, who I didn't know would be a mentor in this way, started giving me records to work at the various radio stations, not just in New Orleans, but in a 100-mile radius around New Orleans. So I would go to, to Memphis or Houston or wherever. So, so then you became like a record promoter. Right? Exactly. Which is exactly. which eventually you left, you know, like you, you kind of did the same thing again. You had to leave accounting, like have to have the courage to leave accounting to become a DJ. Then you had to have the courage to leave being a DJ to become a record promoter. And then you get hired by Mercury Records. When you got hired at, at a Mercury, like they they flew you out. They hired you on the spot. And I'm just curious if you said to yourself, like, OK, now I'm on a mission to promote black artists to a wider and wider audience in America. Like, it, did that start to formulate in your head? Uh, no, I just always took the music on the weight of the music and the strength of the music. My mission mm -hmm. was was to to give the artists whose who's vinyl at that time, we wasn't, it wasn't downloads, whose vinyl I was carrying, to give them a, a fair shot. Ah, right. So, and, so and I was always did, speaking for the artist without the artist even being present or even knowing that I was that I was fighting on their behalf. And and how did you know how to do like you know you were working with Cool in the Gang, the Gap Band? How did like these this was a huge responsibility. H how did you know how to do this? Because I knew the music. Mm -hmm. So I would literally uh I could have an epileptic seizure in your presence <laughs> if you're telling me no when I think and dancing it's really got to be yes. So, so I was, I was relentless. Oh, I love that word. I was relentless. I think today, Mr. Singleton, people are terrified of being relentless, right? They're, they're afraid of how they're going to be perceived by the people around them. Like, I don't want to be pushy. I don't want And so can, can you talk a little bit about what it takes to be relentless? Well, I had black stations that would not play white artists, right? Hmm. But I had uh, the Bee Gees. Um, Saturday Night Fever album. I had the Bee Gees. Uh, I had Funky Town by Lips Inc. Um, but the music was was undeniable. So I was not accepting a no answer. Uh, and I would do sometimes. Sometimes I would do things. At the time, the the Sony Walkman was a big deal mm -hmm. in that era. I, I I wasn't beyond going to a, a, a retailer and buying four or five Walkmans and saying, Hey, I'm going to bring this to Dan because I know Dan. Dan is black and Dan doesn't want to play the Bee Gees. So I'm going to go to the, your radio station and I'm going to give you the Bee Gees on the Walkman. I'm going to put the headphones on your head and tell you to just take a listen to it because I think you're having a problem uh, listening. It's like, just listen to it. And while, and once you've done that, I'm going to ask you, how can you deny your audience of that? I want to like really point this out, what you did. Y you, you did sort of like a fourth dimensional shift on the problem. They said no. You went out and got something that was compelling, the Walkman, which was really compelling at the time. Like, I mean, it was the coolest piece of technology at the time. You went and stuck the, the headphones on someone's head and said, listen, right? Like, brilliant. I hear a lot of people talk about to, today that they can't be successful because they don't feel supported. And what I hear that you did is that you weren't worried about the yes or the no or the support. You had a vision. And you kept focused on that vision. Did, do I have that right? You have it absolutely right. And that's that's brilliant. Funky Town, great mm -hmm. example. It took almost almost six months to break that record because black stations would not play it because it was disco. But whenever it went on any radio station, within two weeks, the record was in their top five or number one. <laughs> so so I was relentless. I, 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 I was able to get a lot of stations who had a real hard time playing uh, disco or artists that didn't look like them. This is going to sound like I'm, I'm kissing butt and I don't mean to, but you're so unbelievably likable, you know? And, and so that's like a tool. Yeah. The likable part, I understood that I was not an authority to be right and make you wrong. So I'm going to co-sign whatever you're feeling, but I'm going to, but I need you to keep the door open because I'm going to, and, and if I don't score today, Tomorrow or day after tomorrow, I'm coming back. So I need to keep the door open. Right. So I, I, I couldn't go get into I don't like you. 
and definitely not making you not like me. That wasn't going to happen. Well, what does that mean? I, I will co-sign whatever you're feeling. What What do you mean by that? Just recently, I, I ran Ruthless Records, Easy E's company, when he died. Uh, there's a group on, on Ruthless Records named Bone Thugs in Harmony. I knew a lot of stations who said, man, I'm not going to play no damn records. We're going to look like saying Bone Thugs in Harmony. They're used to saying Patti LaBelle or Luther Vandross or whatever. They were, so Bone Thugs in Harmony didn't fit standard urban stations format cool but the song so i got into the song first yeah. and, and we, we made a phenomenal video the song was about people dying and meeting your family the crossroad was after they die wow. and i guess i die we'll meet at the crossroads so i would always tell my my staff my promotion people and any radio program i talk to who said they couldn't say Bone Thugs in Harmony. I said, well, good, don't say it. I said, just play the record. Don't say anything. Don't even introduce it. I said, but remember, your audience knows more about dying and letting go than any hip hopper that listens to rap stations. Wow. So, so what I hear you saying is, is that you didn't tell them that they were wrong or that they were making a mistake. In fact, you, in a way, agreed with them and then gave right. them a bigger vision. All the tastemakers, Dan, whether it's a, a programmer of a major radio station in New York, L.A., Miami, or whether it's a, it's a Jimmy Kimmel or, or, or any of those people, they, they pro, they, they've got to appeal to their audience. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to bring you something that's going to appeal to your audience. I, I, I had a big fight with MTV, with that same group, Bones Arts and Harmony. Uh, and at the time, we were up against LL Cool J and... and, and Tupac and some other big name artists who had what we call uh, they had Q value. Uh, Will Smith had Q value because of the Fresh Prince show. And I had Q Bones value is just how well their name is known, right? Exactly. Okay. I had to convince Bone uh, convince MTV by telling MTV that we will recreate the video on the MTV Awards, and we did. And that, and that was the deal closer. After three visits to New York, I'm in LA, three visits to New York, the third visit, that was my pitch to MTV. It, but in my mind, I'm thinking it was about TV programming. Mm -hmm. My catch to MTV was, I'm gonna guarantee you great TV. Yeah. Because we had a great video. Right. And we, and, we, and we recreated that video. We got to be on the show. In my mind, I knew that there were only going to be one rap act on the MTV Awards. One. Mm -hmm. And all the other rap artists and all the other labels, if I got that slot, they would have to oh see my God. act perform. Right. And that's where the most sales are generated. We actually sold 2.2 million additional records yeah. on Bone Thugs. And that, and that MTV Award performance was a big, big part of it because we then became a big record on pop radio stations all across the country. And, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to put a little bow on this because what you did is instead of saying, oh, they're saying no, those jerks, I got to get them to say yes. You said, oh, they're saying no. Let me give them something more of what they want. Right. Instead of trying to get them to say yes to what I want, let me give them more of what they want. They want ratings. They want a spectacle. They want exactly. people talking about their show the next day. W-I-F-M. <laughs> What's in it for me? I had to remember that. With them. Yep. I <laughs> talk about that a MTV? lot. What's in it for MTV? Yep. I had to, I had to put, I had to mentally get in that space to, to get them to say yes. That's great. Can, can you talk a little bit about your experience with Barry Gordy and Motown? Like what, what was your experience in, in working with him? I have a world of respect for Barry Gordy because in, in my mind, I know that Barry Gordy represents the one black man in America that, that opened the door for black artists to be on album covers. And, and when we weren't on album covers, it wasn't, it wasn't the norm in the late 50s, early 60s. So when we began to see Diana Ross or The Temptations or Gladys and the Phipps on album covers, glammed up, gowns and tuxedos and the works, that came from Motown. That came from Barry Gordy's camp. Mm. And for me, it was always a big deal that our artists look right. And you most brought... time, my, my graphic people were white. Mm. Oftentimes, they would, they would paint us too dark. 
or too or too light. Yeah. And I'm the guy who look at, oh no, that doesn't work. <laughs> and, and and what you just said is so important because what you did is you brought a tremendous amount of change to the industry. And people don't like change. And unfortunately, our country has a long, sad history of really resisting change when it's black people who are leading the change. And, you know, like what you just said, white photographers had their cameras set for white people. It's not that they're racist, but there's sort of an inherent racism where people don't even know that they're operating in a way that could be considered racist. How did you deal with people who, to, to make them more um, concerned, to make them more sensitive to your plight, you know, when you, know, that's a good you really couldn't call I them actually, racist? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, please. Uh, how did I deal with people? You'd be surprised how people uh, come on board because people want to win. And for me, it was never about being rude or insensitive or, or arrogant. Uh, I, I always had humility. Uh, and, and I would always try to explain my position with some degree of humility. Uh, you, you, you mentioned my, my accounting background. Yeah. When I, was, when I was first employed at MCA, we signed Patty LaBelle from Sony, CBS. Um, Patty had just had about three or four phenomenal records off of an album on Sony. When we signed her, uh, we we didn't have a record and we didn't have a budget for anything but recording. Wow. So all of the heads of marketing at Universal, MCA Universal, argued with me because I wanted to buy tickets for Patty LaBelle concerts. And normally we want to be buying like 60, 70, 80 tickets, a lot. <laughs> No budget. But I knew how valuable she was in the black community. She was she was black radios, Aretha Franklin, during mm. that period. And Aretha didn't have uh, a, a, a big record out at the time. So everybody's arguing with me about about the show. I, I took a meeting with the head of accounting at, at MCA, a guy named Dan McGill uh, and his girl, Gail. And I just told him, I said, look, I said, we got to have tickets for Patty in all of these markets. I said, we can't think that we're going to be able to walk into the market three months from now with a record on Patty. And we're going to just say, but there's no budget. I said, well, I said, fine, create a budget, but we need a budget and we need the tickets. All right. So, well, so I don't know. I don't know what they did. But the budget <laughs> was created and we were able to provide tickets. Now, when, when new attitude came out from the Beverly Hills cops, went right up the charts in, in, in record time and the record stuck. I hear you doing the same powerful thing over and over again. You hear a no. Like, we can't do it. It doesn't work. We don't have it. And rather than fight with the no, it, it sounds like you're jumping over it and giving them a vision of what saying yes will give them. It's important, Dan, to give people something positive to think about because eventually people people buy in. It eventually people buy in. You're, people are pretty um, receptive to to rational uh, rational situations mm -hmm. and people are pretty perceptive if you give them some sub, something of substance to, to weigh their decision on and I never beat you up about your decision I just I just let you know that it's not the one it's not the best one for us I, I think what you have to do is go from no to no without the loss of enthusiasm and maybe that comes to you naturally. Maybe you had to, to, to develop it. But I think either way for my audience, I think what I'm saying is, is that that's a skill you have to develop. You have it's to be about, able to stay enthusiastic. I, I believe what I was saying. Um, and it doesn't mean that I didn't fail sometimes or I didn't lose. <laughs> I, I bet. Uh, and, and, and we're always dealing with a, a, a limited amount of time. Um, New edition. I'll share this and I'll and I'll and I'll give you the mic back. That same album cover was was the song that we led with was a song called Cool It Now on New Edition. We had the record ready, we was about to release it, but the Jacksons dropped a record. It was a kind of a rock vibe record. We listened to the record at MCA and we thought, oh man, this is a wop, this is a white record. This is a rock, this ain't gonna <laughs> this is not gonna work with the black community. But if we put our new edition record out right now, 
We're not gonna we're not gonna be on the end caps in the record stores. We're not gonna get the the number of units ordered because they're gonna order the Jacksons because the Jacksons are coming off a big record. We we paused the release of that new edition record for probably about sixty days. Mm -hmm. We we then began to realize we were right. We're gonna we're gonna do with them what people can't do with the Jackson Five, which is gonna make them accessible. Wow. You can't get to the Jackson Five. That's out of the question. Uh -huh. We're going to make them accessible. So we did things at schools. We did we did autograph signings at major record stores and the whole nine yards, and it, and it all worked. I want to get back to to, um, to to some more music questions. You go to Casablanca Records in 1977, and this is the height of the disco era. And I got to tell you, Mr. Singleton, if I could hop in the DeLorean and go back in time to any period, it would be in the disco era in the music business. And so I, I, I have the next best thing right here. You got to tell me, what was that world like? You know, you, wow. you're working with, with Donna Summer, with Cher, with the village people. With, was it just insane? It was weird. <laughs> I never forget being in Donna Summer's hotel room. Uh, this was in Dallas. And she was in a negligee. Um, she was married to a, a guy named Bruce Swedeen. Um, but Donna was such a gorgeous woman. Yes. All I remember was being in her room thinking to myself, wow, I'm in Donna Summer's room and she's in a negligee. <laughs> but, and her husband was right there. Too, but it, it wouldn't have mattered. What a killer. It was just, just the thought of it. Um, it was a great time. I yeah. Mean, we, 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 I was able to work share a share record on black radio. What, was it hard getting share on black radio? No, not it wasn't. Really? No, Be because I, I, I guess I, I, I'd come through a barrier with, with stations, and I began to promote music on the merit of the music. Of course. I also have had the privilege of, of doing a, a Captain and Tennille record back in the day of, of do that to me one more time. <laughs> Same thing. Great song. And, and, I, and I would always, when I needed to, grab a page out of Martin Luther King's book. Discrimination of any kind is no good. So I would plant that seed just in case you, pu you, you were pushing back wow. on, a, on, a color, on a color line. And then I would reinforce it with, and, and what, how about your audience? They would like it. And That's phenomenal. And, and I'd let people marinate on that. But usually I scored... 99% of the time I score. There, there, we're, we're getting tight on time, and there's, and there's two things I'm going to cover bef before we talk a little bit about your business, um, Singleton Entertainment Corp., and your new podcast, My Business is Pleasure. Um, the, the first thing I want you to talk about is in 1987, you were working for Warner, and yeah. you, you had a lot of uh, autonomy at that point, and I love the story that you told uh, about Prince's album, Love Sexy. Yeah, okay. Now, now we, we, we got to keep this tight, but just, in just like a minute, can you tell me about that? Chris would not let anyone see the artwork, not even our chairman. No one could see the artwork. When we finally got ready to release the record, we saw the album cover with Prince in the nude with a fig leaf covering his <laughs> private parts. That was the album. Everybody was stunned. But we were big at Warner Brothers, more than any way I've ever worked, big on artists' freedom in terms of creativity. So the album came, and, and, it, and it did well. How, how did you push that through? Because, I mean, didn't people look at that and go, okay, no, we are not putting this out? So it always comes down to the music. All right. It always comes down to the That's music. That's amazing. The, the other thing I want to ask you about is, like, what is going on with the Grammys right now? You know, the Grammys is, is going through something that the entire music industry is going through. The Grammy is going through a, 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 time, a time capsule where things have changed. Now... People like The Weeknd uh, not getting a nomination and Lil Wayne not getting a nomination. Yeah. That always happens. That is not as big of an issue. But what is an issue is that the Grammy need to do some things. And I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to kind of zip that up a little bit because I have a, a, a plan in my head that the Academy needs to it needs to at least hear me out and let's begin to integrate some things because the Grammy is in trouble and the Grammy will run the risk of losing its foundation to an organization like the American Music Awards, oh. who seem to be doing it pretty good. Mm. The Grammys is the only award show that converts into money for the artists. So it's very important to the culture, and it's important that we fix what's broken, and, and it's like tuning a car up and get it back on track the right way. 
in every industry, there's always change. You know, I mean, look what happened to Sears when Amazon came on the yeah. on the scene. Yeah. They didn't pivot, right? Yeah. They just hoped that it would sort of all go away. Now, when you came into the business, um, you know, it was records and tapes, and now it's streaming and digital files. How did you manage to have the courage or the willingness to relearn your own business and be and continue to be s successful it's not easy i remember from a from a very very young boy i would always hear people say that everything must change but mm. they'll say change is inevitable i only get to know what that means when i got to become an adult <laughs> and i and i and i fight change i resisted i resisted the page i resisted the fax machine i resisted text uh, all those things now that I've gotten way older, I'm I'm accepting those things, and uh, you know I'm even on TikTok, so I'm <laughs> I'm not active. You. I don't dance on TikTok. <laughs> but you've got to be, you've got to embrace change. Yeah, you've got to embrace change. And, and all we all know that, like you know, we all know, you know, take risk, face your fears. But when it comes time to embrace change or take risk or face your fears, people don't do it because it's hard. What would you suggest? Like, what what can my audience take away? from how to, how to handle it when it gets hard, how do you keep moving forward? I, I typically use this example of people. You know the old school wire hangers? When you yes. want to break one, you sure, gotta sure. bend it like 10, 15 times, yeah. then it breaks? It yeah. doesn't break on the first bend, or the second or third mm. one. I, I think it's what you're persistent. saying is, is that when you know when change happens and like I don't want to learn something new, it seems like that uncomfortable feeling will go on forever. But I think what you're saying is if you keep at it a little bit, there's something really amazing right around the corner. Well, I tell people all the time, you're never too old to learn and never too young to teach. Uh, I want to get to something really important. First, your company, Singleton Entertainment Corp., and what you're doing with that, how people can connect with you, and you know, what are the amazing new things you're bringing into the world with your company? Well, we, we are, uh, we're a consulting company. What we strive for is to help people to achieve their goals in whatever their business mm -hmm. is. You know, and, we're, and we're diving deep right now into streaming, streamcasting, streamcasting shows, um, and trying to get some artists to understand that that's their future. And yeah. and I would encourage people to get in touch with you. You know, whether you're in the music business or not, what we learned about Mr. Singleton today is he is an expert at getting past the no. And in, in no matter what business that you're in, the biggest struggle that you're going to have is getting past the no, but both the external no and the internal no. And clearly you are an expert at that. I'm, I'm hoping that I'll have you on my show one day. Oh, my podcast my podcast, I haven't started it yet, uh -huh. but my podcast title will be My Business is Pleasure. And so people like yourself, Dan, who, who does these phenomenal interviews, we would want to know some of your magic because a lot of what you do, you do it for other people and for your audience. That's the pleasure side of what, you know, your, of what your business is. Okay. And, and what would be the best way for people to get in touch with you if they're interested in Singleton Entertainment Corp.? I'm going to give you my email address because that's always good. Great. S-E-C Ernie at yahoo.com. Of course. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm also on, on Facebook. I will put that link uh, on screen and in my show. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll definitely include that. Thank you so much for your honesty today and all that you've shared. Uh, you know, like, what have we learned? You know, create the theater of the mind. You know, talk to people about a vision that they want. Don't just try to sell them on what you want. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, like really stepping into the things that you struggle with and facing them. And, and something that you talked about that I just loved is that any struggle that we face, you know, from what I've learned from you today, it's staying with it, like staying inside of the struggle, um, not giving in to the no and staying with the vision. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here, for being on the show, for sharing your, your wisdom with my audience. Um, I, I want to remind my audience that, that you can get uh, my blueprint for success. It's called Jumping the Gap, Kill Your Story and Take Action. My free book, just text the word GAP, G-A-P, to my phone, 213 Four zero nine eight three six six gap G A P. Thanks. Tag gap G A P two one three 
409-8366. Text the word GAP and get my book. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Shock to the System. It is an honor and a privilege to serve you all. Please you, um, stay connected. Subscribe to this show because I am here to help you and your success. Be well, everybody. Bye-bye. Hey, if you have some thoughts about the show you'd like to share with us, or if you think you're shocked to the system guest material, send me a text at 213-409-8366. Let me know what you think, or let me know why you think you'd be a great guest for this show. Thanks again for listening. I hope you're inspired to unleash your inner superhero on the world.